Hello everyone. I welcome you to the CEC lecture series. I am Nupur Chawla, teaching English literature at Maitri College, Delhi University. And today I am going to uh, discuss with you yet another topic in the ongoing uh, lecture series that is on the feminist texts. And today uh, we are going to discuss another very seminal um, uh, feminist uh, uh, icon, or we could say a woman uh, who's associated with America, and uh, and she was active during the 19th century, and her name is Lucretia Mott. So Lucretia Mott um, uh, actually, uh, uh, you know, was born in uh, 1793, and she died in 1880. uh uh and uh she was actually an american abolitionist um and a women's rights uh, uh activist um so lucretia mott actually uh, uh you know wrote this very uh, uh, seminal piece which is called the discourse on woman so that actually uh, uh is a speech that she delivered uh, where she takes up the question of uh, you know women's condition in the 19th century So uh, what we uh, must keep in mind is that uh, while Lucretia Mott was an American abolitionist yet at the same time uh, you know she was very very active in uh, the civil and the social sphere and she was also that woman who uh, you know uh, uh, intellectually as well thought about the position of women in society uh If we look at uh, you know just some uh, quick details uh, 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 around Lucretia Mott, uh, she actually became still more committed to the women's cause after she was excluded from the World Anti-Slavery Convention in London in 1840. right and uh, uh, this was the reason that uh, you know kind of also really perturbed mot and uh, made her uh, take up this cause with uh, you know still more uh, uh, you know fervor so uh, you see in spite of being one of the six women delegates uh, for this convention uh, there were a few uh, men who voted to exclude the american women from participating in this convention and the uh, uh, the very few female delegates kids who were there they were also required to sit in a segregated area so this basically you know also tells us about uh, the times when she was writing and uh, the immediate conditions that would have inspired the kind of thoughts that we see in her text uh, discourse on women so uh, we also see that uh, you know lucretia mott was a close associate of the american writer ralph waldo emerson so uh, those of us who have studied american literature and for that matter even if you have not studied uh, it uh, you know at length but still uh, you know emerson is uh, is one of the uh, very uh, uh, you know kind of seminal writers when we whenever we talk about american literature So uh coming back to the main agenda for discussion uh, today that is Lucretia Mott's texts uh, a discourse on women now it was written in 1849 right so that immediately uh, you know situates the text in the heart of the 19th century so the foremost thing that we say is that in this uh, um, essay or in this speech uh, Mott confronts the framing of women as essentially inferior so what she does is basically that she uh, you know kind of uh, in the beginning of the essay she goes over the existing arguments uh, be it uh, you know arguments in religion be it arguments in society so she uh, kind of you know refers to them and uh, you know from there she uh, questions that kind of a framing of women as an essentially inferior uh, you know uh, uh, category of individuals and that is something which is uh, you know a kind of uh, not really um, encouraged uh, by uh, mot uh, in fact we see her very strongly and uh, and very boldly oppose this stance right now when we talk about uh, this kind of questioning or opposition that mot displays in this essay we must keep in mind that uh, you know uh, i mean this opposition she does it in a very very sophisticated manner of course as we go on and discuss the arguments that she uh, you know kind of foregrounds this will automatically become a, 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 you know evident to you so the first thing that she says is that and i'll quote 
she says that we deny that the present position of women is her true sphere of usefulness nor will she uh, nor will she attain to this sphere until the disabilities and disadvantages religious civil and social which impede her progress are removed out of her way unquote so this is her a uh, beginning stance in the essay so the foremost thing that she says is that we deny the present position of woman okay so now what is the present position of woman that is a position which actually uh, you know kind of relegates the woman as uh, uh, you know someone that is inferior to man which is uh, you know a uh, kind of a conception which is uh, based in this kind of a biased uh, uh, thought so to say and she says that we deny it right so look at the use of the word we deny it so there is a very confident uh, negation of the existing uh, uh, position on women okay and the next important part in this quotation is also that she says that until the disabilities and the disadvantages are removed out of her way she cannot uh, attain her true potential right now these disabilities and disadvantages she actually talks about these in three terms one is religious second is civil and third is social so basically what she is highlighting is that how uh, you know a woman's framing as uh, uh, as someone who is not uh, you know equal to man happens in all these three spheres so religious if we look at the first sphere that is religious so we see that how in um, you know various scriptures uh, the way women are represented now in fact before we go ahead with this argument we should also keep in mind that a lot of times there is a gap between what actually exists in the scriptures and uh, the way it is interpreted right so what uh, what mot then brings our attention to is the fact that how a lot of times even the religious authority is used in order to um, you know kind of justify this stance that women are inferior so there is this religious angle to this entire discourse of inferiority that had existed in 19th century next she also talks about the civil right she 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 uses the word uh, civil now what do we mean by civil uh civil is that sphere which pertains to uh you know rights that pertains to law legality and all these aspects are uh, concerned uh, or concerning an individual's presence in society so even uh, uh you know when we talk about law when we when we look at uh, uh the position of women in terms of the rights that are available to her uh even that domain presents a picture of some kind of a bias then the third thing that she talks about or the, or the third domain that she talks about that is social now what do we understand by the term social social is that sphere where the individual is uh, you know kind of uh, or maybe we can say that it's that sphere which involves the interactions between individuals right and the terms in which they uh, kind of converse or interact with one another so in these interactions then the way these interactions are uh, you know kind of um uh, uh, engineered a lot of times the kind of ideas the kind of discourses that circulate through these interactions or in fact for that matter the nature of these interactions as well between different individuals in society in the social domain then also you know serves to contribute to this kind of a stature of women and right at the outset she says that we need to remove these obstacles out of her way so we see that how her engagement then is not pertaining to or is not limited to just one aspect of being right instead she uh, you know kind of refers to these three Uh, 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 dimensions these three domains that need to be addressed if one needs to establish uh, you know or or maybe revise a woman's position in society uh from there 
The second important argument that one notices, uh, uh, you know, in Mott's essay is pertaining to this uh, uh, phrase that she uses, that is true woman, right? So she actually talks about the realization of the idea of true woman by every uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, every, every every woman in society. So she says that every woman should be capable of realizing, of uh, living this entire idea of true woman. Now, what did she mean by this term? Let's try to understand that. So the first, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of a reference or the, or the first indication of this phrase um, is that a woman becomes a true woman when she when she rises above the attention to merely outwardly beauty and vanity and she starts to focus on as Mott also says in her essay the cultivation and development of the mind right so uh, that's when so when a woman uh, focuses her energy focuses her attention on self-development, on the cultivation of her mind, when she tries to engage intellectually, uh, uh, you know, in uh, in different uh, uh, ideas, uh, with different ideas. So that is when she, uh, you know, kind of uh, actually starts to cultivate, to 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 cultivate herself, and thereby also expand her individuality beyond mere physical beauty. Right. So you see that. When uh, Mott points towards this idea of outwardly beauty, of uh, vanity, etc., now she is actually, uh, you know, uh, 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 facing head on this kind of a stereotype which exists in society, right? So, um, women are most often associated with or they are kind of limited to just being objects of uh, beauty that are to be admired right so so uh, there is flattery which they are resorted to uh, they are uh, you know kind of uh, uh, praised sky high only on account of their beauty and more so you know uh, we are talking about the 19th century context let's not uh, forget that so uh, this actually, uh, uh, you know, needs to be still deeply understood. And Mott is, uh, you know, seems to be also, you know, kind of hinting at this aspect. So, you see, um, this is in fact uh, one of the uh, strengths of uh, uh, women, that is her sensuality, right? Now, this is something that a man, uh, uh, you know, does not really have in that measure. So, the uh, sensuality of a woman then, uh, which is supposed to be her strength, uh, which is supposed to be her distinguishing feature, is then considered to be as some kind of a threat by society. And thereby, we see that how this strength is, you know, kind of very um, uh, systematically turned into her weakness, whereby she is forced to limit almost as if her entire being to just this one aspect. And women like Lucretia Mott, who are smart enough to see through, uh, you know, this kind of, a, uh, 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 you know, maybe we can say um, uh, um, irrational uh, way of uh, handling individuals uh, or, this, or, or this kind of an irrational thought, she makes everyone aware that it is important for women while they do, uh, you know, pay attention to the outwardly graces as well. She's not denying that, but she says that it is equally important for them to cultivate and develop their mind as well, right? And this is the point where she also, you know, kind of distinguishes between these two terms yet again. She uses she use the word womanish and true woman. So womanish then actually, um, uh, you know, when uh, uh, she uses this term in order to indicate uh, this kind of a tendency of uh, uh, women to just limit themselves to the female or the or the feminine charms, while a true woman then uh, is that idea uh, which combines both uh, the effort or the uh, action taken on part of women to cultivate. Uh, themselves intellectually while also paying attention to their uh, uh, you know feminine graces right so that's the second point that she uh, uh, makes in her essay 
Now moving on, we go to the third argument that Lucretia Mott represents. Now she seems to be redefining femininity. Now first, uh, uh, before we look into the redefinition of femininity, we need to understand what exactly is femininity at first, right? So as just now pointed out, uh, you know, a while ago, I told you that how femininity then uh, was uh, somewhat restricted to or limited to just, uh, uh, you know, a few essential features or character traits uh, that were uh, ascribed to women. That she was supposed to look beautiful. She was supposed to uh, be graceful uh, in the way she conducts herself. She was supposed to be engaged in the, uh, you know, domestic uh, activities, right? So all these were then considered to be uh, the uh, the features of a uh, femininity. But Lucretia Mott then redefines this this particular kind of an understanding of femininity and for that matter all the feminists even after her have been uh, you know kind of trying to give these alternate definitions of what it means to be a woman right so let's very quickly take a look at this quote from Mott's essay and see what does she say about this idea of being a woman she says nor will woman fulfill less her domestic relations as the faithful companion of her chosen husband and the fitting mother of her children. Her self-respect will be increased, preserving the dignity of her being, nor will her feminine character be impaired." Unquote. Now over here, when she is talking about, so the, the, the crux of this quotation is that she says that when a woman is, uh, you know, kind of uh, devoted or when a woman devotes herself to uh, the development of her mind, to the development of her, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, or maybe cultivation of her uh, 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 rational intellect. Um, so when she is uh, uh, engaged in that kind of a, a, a pursuit, Lucretia Mott says that this seems to define or this seems to be a very important element of femininity. But she says that while we introduce this new segment or this new interpretation, we are not saying that woman will be any less in fulfilling her domestic relations, right? And this is what is the beauty of Mott's uh, argument also. So she doesn't go into the black or white. She doesn't reject one and accept the other. She seems to be striking this very fine balance whereby she, uh, you know, kind of keeps intact uh, the, uh, the strengths of women. She keeps intact, in fact, those features that do define uh, a very unique kind of a womanhood. And at the same time, she introduces the idea of cultivation of the intellect within that right therefore she says that a woman who is committed to uh, you know uh, kind of working on herself it is not that she will be any less of a faithful companion to her husband it is not that she will not fulfill her motherly duties towards her children instead when she does both when she devotes time to the development of her own self of her individual self by engaging in uh, uh, you know uh, 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 intellectual uh, uh, pursuits while she balances that along with uh, her uh, you know other um, uh, so to say um, uh, you know domains of uh, existence as a as a wife as a mother or for that matter uh, as a woman, uh, you know, kind of uh, 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 justifying her space in the in the uh, uh, in, in in the domestic sphere. So when she does both of these, that's uh, how she says that her self-respect will be increased. So this will also give her that kind of a confidence, whereby she will no longer you know kind of see herself as restricted to just one kind of pursuit but instead she will realize her potential 
of living in these complexities of uh, you know uh, so to say uh, evolving herself while at the same time also experiencing the warmth of the uh, uh, domestic sphere which again is not her sole responsibility but that is a responsibility that she shares with the man okay so let's uh, uh, this is uh, very important for us to over here at this juncture also understand that lucretia mott is not giving this essentialist so to say argument that a woman belongs to the domestic sphere instead she is saying that both men and women together you know kind of contribute to what we understand as the domestic but she is also going a step further and saying that while women have so far been just relegated to this private or the domestic sphere now it's important for them to combine that realm of operation along with this kind of an intellectual pursuit which then will become a way for her to preserve her sense of dignity and self respect right uh next the other uh, important argument that that lucretia mott makes in her essay uh, discourse on women is that uh, you know she also uh, talks about this renewed idea of modesty right so when we talk about modesty you see it is uh, uh, always considered in terms of uh, like this is considered to be so to say a virtue of um, conventionally i mean conventionally it is also it, it it is taken to be the virtue of women right but then um uh, lucretia mott in her essay uh, actually inverts this argument and she says that uh, these virtues and one of them being modesty differing as they may in degree in man and woman are of the same nature and call forth our admiration wherever manifested unquote so basically what is she trying to say she is trying to say that the virtue of modesty and other such similar virtues then right they are uh, not only restricted to uh, uh, to a woman's conduct alone in fact she says that uh, we uh, are able to appreciate uh, this value even as it is manifest in a man as well so she is actually hitting out at the stereotype or at this essentialization of woman as a modest uh, individual right so lucretia mott is saying that it's not just women but even men can be modest and it calls forth as she's saying our admiration wherever it is manifested right so um these are some of the important uh, uh, uh points that she makes in her essay and from there on she further uh, takes on uh, you know examples from history she talks about politics she talks about the legal aspect now what are the arguments pertaining to these uh, uh, you know uh, 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 segments that's something that we are going to discuss in the next part of the lecture thank you